You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey, what's up, everybody? Hope you're well, and thank you for choosing to listen to my show, Straight to Video. As always, I'm your host, Rob Lane, bringing you a brand new episode every Friday. So how's your week been? Hope you're set for a fun bank holiday weekend here in the UK. I'll be heading to Chesham this Sunday, playing bass for 90s pop legends Let Loose as part of the very first Chesham Fringe Festival. So maybe see some of you there. If you're not in Chesham, some of you may well be hanging out at Slam Dunk Festival, which is happening this weekend too. And today's guest will be appearing at both the Leeds and Hatfield events. So after you've listened to my chat with the fantastic Taylor Acorn, I hope if you're previously unfamiliar, you'll be going to check out her show. Taylor currently lives out in Nashville and up until the past few years she was forging a really successful and upcoming country music career. Inside though she was and always will be a fan of late 90s 2000s pop punk which is what she grew up on. So taking a huge risk she changed gears and headed into that high energy pop punk territory and happy to report it's paying off big time. After just completing her first US headline tour, she's over in the UK for Slam Dunk and a headlining show in London on Monday the 28th of May at the Islington Academy before heading right back to the US for even more shows. Her new single, High Horse, is out now and it's the follow-up to one of my favourite songs of the year so far, Greener, which is streaming everywhere too. We chat all about her journey through the different genres of music, the unpredictability of the industry and what makes you stand out along with lots of other really fun stuff. Taylor is without doubt really proud of the journey she's been on and where she's going, so I hope some of you enjoy this introduction, and those already on board, I hope you hear some new stories. As always, this Straight to Video podcast is proudly presented to you in association with Affinity Photo, an incredible piece of photo editing software which I've been using for graphic design the past couple of years. I always use Affinity to create the podcast episode art you see each week, and what's good is that it's an extremely affordable alternative to other programs on the market, so please, if you can, check them out at affinity.serif.com. All right, let's dive into my chat with Taylor Acorn. The new single, High Horse, is out now, and you can find all their live dates at tayloracorn.com. But right now, please enjoy my straight-to-video talk with Taylor Acorn. I have nothing to do today. I am home for the, what I was going to say for the week, but I guess, yeah, for the week. So I have no plans. I made sure I had nothing to do. So my time is yours. So you're back from an American tour. How's the dates been? Does it feel good to be home for a short while? It feels good, but it feels weird. I won't lie. I think I, I just become so accustomed to the chaos of being on the road that when I'm home and I have nothing to do, I... I'm like in panic mode. <laughs> I should be doing something. When sound check? Exactly. I'm like, it goes from so much chaos to nothing. And that to me is like the weirdest feeling. And so I'm missing it a little bit. This tour was just incredible. I mean, it was our first full US headline run. Opening act that was with us was incredible. All of the fans that came out were incredible. It was like one of those moments where it's like, I just never want this to end ever. Once you're in the groove. Yes. All of the people that I work with on the road, they're all my best friends and we all get along just like so wonderfully. And so for me to not be with them 24 seven anymore is very weird, but I'm very lucky that, you know, we'll be back out next week and we'll be, you know, in the UK and stuff. And so I'm just twiddling my thumbs until then. It feels like a lifetime. (laughs) Have you got a list of jobs to do now you're back? Oh, I mean, clean my house, (laughs) spend some time with my cat. Who's the cat sitter whilst you're away? I have a roommate who watches her, but I've been like lucky enough. My mom has come out and stayed for a few days and my boyfriend's parents came and stayed for a few days at my house while I was gone. So I have some people that have just popped in and and were just willing to watch her, but she definitely does not like when I leave. And so it's a little weird to be back and she's being a little distant, but she is sitting next to me right now. So I'm like, maybe we're on good terms. Wait for that big, big bus tour. You can take her out. I know. I know. I'm, I'm hoping for the day. She does not do very well with travel though. So it would have to be like a big, very homey, spacious bus feeling. I don't think it could be like a normal 
normal bandwagon bus situation. Also, there's a lot of logistics that go into that with a cat. So <laughs> maybe one day, maybe one day. But you're back for a short while before coming to the UK for the second time, I believe, after playing Download Festival last year. Was that your first time overseas and first big festival? Yeah, that was my first time overseas ever in my life. So it was really, really cool to be able to go on that occasion, like to be able to play download. And I honestly, I kind of felt like I wasn't worthy. (laughs) I was like, who let me do this? This doesn't make any sense. But yeah, that was the first time that we'd ever been over to the UK. It's beautiful out there. It was very hot though. I think it was like one of the hottest days it had ever been in in a really long time. It's either one or the other at Donington. Yeah. (laughs) It's either going to absolutely rain all the time or it'll be scorching hot. Did you have any clue what to expect about the festival? Did you know much about the history or legacy of it? I've known a little bit about it. Definitely watched a lot of videos over the years, especially like Reading and Leeds. And, you know, just to kind of maybe one day if I make it here to know what to expect. But to be honest, like going into it, I know it was a big mix of bands and artists and things, but I definitely felt like the least hardcore. (laughs) So... Again, I was like, who's letting me do this? I don't know how anybody is going to receive my music, but it was amazing. And just being able to be there and like experience the culture and one of my first festivals, I was like, this is nuts. (laughs) I think bands and artists like yourself are always a real breath of fresh air at festivals like that. Well, thank you. Downloads become so varied. I mean, it used to be called Monsters of Rock (laughs) in the 80s and early 90s. So it was all like the legendary hard rock bands and metal Mm -hmm. bands. It'd be like five or six bands on the bill and that'd be it. Now, I have no idea how many bands are on the bill. There's dozens and dozens. Yeah, it was huge. And I mean, we watched a couple bands. We sat in and watched I Prevail. And like seeing how many people were there when we like stepped outside of the little artist area and like actually got to walk around the festival, I was mind blown at how many stages there were and like the bands that were there. And it felt very like overwhelming. I was like, this is crazy. I don't know if I could ever attend this as just like a festival goer. I was like, I don't know how anybody can do this. This is nuts. Yeah, it was awesome. I'm really looking forward to hopefully doing that festival again, hopefully in the next few years. People are losing their minds this year because they've got Busted headlining one of the tents, which I think they're going to be one of the bands of the weekend. People are going to be, most of the crowd, they don't think it's a good idea. They'll go and see them, see how bad it sucks. And they'll go there and they'll be like, damn, these are actually a really good rock band. Honestly, I think also too, people change their perspective once they see artists live. You know what I mean? Like they can hear them on a streaming platform and be like, man, I don't know how I feel about this band, but then see them live. I mean, that was honestly, I really loved Palais Royale, but they're a band that I had that same perspective on. I really didn't know much about them. And when you hear their music on Spotify and then you watch their live show, it's like two different entities. It's so weird, but in a good way. So I have a feeling that people will probably like watch and be like, oh, this is really sick. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you're coming over for Slam Dunk Festival this year. That's got a great lineup. I mean, even for like an old dude like me, I'm a rock guy, but Download this year has only a few bands, which I actually know, including Busted. (laughs) But Slam Dunk, I'm like, damn, like All American Rejects, Boys Like Girls, Pale Waves. Mm -hmm. You Me at Six, all of those bands, yep. A buddy of mine, he actually plays keyboards for the band The Selector, who are on like the Legends stage. They were like formed in the late 70s and do all this kind of two-tone ska stuff. Who are you looking forward to catching on the bill? Oh my gosh. Well, You Me at Six is one of those bands that I've followed for a while and I've never had the opportunity to see them live. So I'd really love to see them. Obviously, All American Rejects, huge fan of them. Such great songs. Such great songs. Excited to see Water Parks. I've never seen them live against The Current also. Have you checked the running schedule to see who you're clashing with? I think I like overlooked it maybe a few weeks ago, but I can't really remember who is. You weren't thinking, damn it. I think I was just like so scatterbrained while we were on tour. So I like looked at it very quick. I'm probably going to go look at it now that you brought it up and see who's playing during my set. And I'll be like, ah, shit. I think if I can remember correctly, it was somebody who was pretty, pretty big. Are Pale Waves on your radar at all? Yeah, they are. That's another band that I'm like really stoked. Such good songs on them. I've seen them live a couple of times. Yeah. I think they've got like, is it two or three albums under the belt? And I saw them on the second tour. And I was like, Mm -hmm. this is like a greatest hit set. Every song is amazing. Yeah, they're sick. So I'm really excited to see 
see them. I really love recently, I've been really getting into female fronted bands. So really excited to see them. Also very excited to see this artist. Uh, she's actually a UK based artist, Rory. You really, really like her music. She has a really amazing story too. So it's exciting to see her on the lineup. Honestly, everybody that's playing my stage, I'm like, can we just stick around and like watch everyone? So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. You got to play the Underworld in London too on your last visit. Was that a pretty cool show for you to have all those people come out and see you in? It's kind of a pretty intimate venue. Was it old 300 people or something like that? I think it was like 600 at the time. And that was really cool because, you know, we had played Download, but we had never headlined outside of the country before. And so it actually sold out. So it was like kind of mind blowing because I was like, why is this happening? The dressing room is literally right next to the stage as well. So you yes. can feel the vibe that's happening. Uh-huh. But they treated us like so well at that venue and had such an amazing time. Did you get to go around Camden at all? A little bit, yeah. We had a little bit of time pre-show. I am excited to come back now because we'll have a little bit more time, like a couple of days before Slam Dunk to be able to actually go and like adventure around and kind of experience the city. But we did get to go see like Big Ben and stuff like that. So that was really cool. Got to take the tube. Is that what it's called? Got to take the tube to Camden and, you know, got to shop around and stuff. So that was cool. I'm just glad to have a little bit more time now to actually like get to enjoy it. Soak it all in a little bit. Yep. Yep. I was watching some videos of like the Underworld show and I was genuinely interested into what crowd your music would attract, particularly over in the UK. I was wondering if it would be like the old school pop punk fans who grew up on the same stuff as you did. But watching the clips, there's all teenagers down the front singing the hearts out. Are you finding it's this whole generational crossover? Yeah, I mean, even here in the US, my fan base is really interesting in the sense of like, because I was a country artist a few years ago too. And I've been very, very fortunate in the sense of like, you know, when I did transition over into this new genre of music that I make, those fans stuck with me, or at least a lot of them did. And so it's like a mix of country fans that are now new fans of pop punk. It's pop punk fans. It's an older crowd, people that are like, you know, maybe in like their late 30s, 40s. I mean, there have even been like 50s and 60s that people that have come out and are just rocking out with everybody, young kids. I mean, it's a really crazy array of people. One of my friends said it best. They're like, standing in the crowd, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, all of these people are all together. And I think that's really cool. It's like bringing a bunch of different people that might not be in the same room in a normal setting together. And they're all hopefully there because they're all experiencing a lot of the same things, which I really love. And they're making friends and they're, I don't know, it's just, it's a really, really cool group of people that come out. I was trying to think how I heard about you and I think it was your acoustic stripped down version of Almost by Bowling for Soup. Yeah. Which was on TikTok a few years ago because I think Jarrett maybe shared it. And I thought it was fantastic. Oh, thank you. Are they a band that had a big influence on you? I mean, such great songs which go well into that acoustic format. Yeah, for sure. I remember distinctly, I think I was probably like seven or eight years old. Sorry, my allergies right now are so crazy. So if you like hear me like sniffling, I'm going to like step away from the mic. I need to go blow my nose. They're crazy here in Nashville for some reason. It's just like off the chain. But I remember when I was like seven or eight years old and, you know, TRL was a big thing. And like they used to play, they don't do it so much anymore, but MTV had music videos on loop like all morning. That was always like my morning routine. I would go and my dad would make me like Eggos and I would sit and I would watch music videos. And I remember Girl All the Bad Guys Want was one of the music videos that came on. And I was so infatuated with that song. Everything was perfect about that. The song, the video. Oh my gosh, yes. Stars the aligned. video, everything. It still like plays in my brain. I'm like, I'll never forget. She like walks up to the TV and it's so, it, yeah, it's like, it's so funny. But they have always been like a band that I've been really, really drawn to. I think just because I love, I'm such a sucker for humor and music. If you can kind of make fun of yourself a little bit and make fun of things I don't know. There's something that I really like love about that. And they've always been a band that I felt like did that really, really well. And it's always so catchy. And so it was really, really awesome to see him, you know, reach out. And I actually got to meet him when we played Riot Fest. He came up to me and he was like, I love what you're doing. And I was like, what are you talking about? I love what you've been doing. Like, you're amazing. You're a legend. They're still at the top of their game as well. It just seems to be getting bigger and bigger. At the top. I mean, such a nice guy too. So to be able to like have him say such nice things and come up to me and be like, I loved that cover and I loved your music. 
it meant a lot. So I was like, this is really weird. Very full circle. Isn't 1985 your karaoke go-to? That one is actually my karaoke go-to. Mine and my sister's. It's always been like a fun song that we always sing together. So yeah, I haven't done karaoke in a minute. I should probably find a karaoke bar in the UK. My band loves karaoke. Do so it, do it. we're going to have to do it. Yeah. Maybe come out and you can hear me sing 1985. There you go. But you're not one to shy away from collaborations. You've done some great stuff with 408, Cassidy Pope, Magnolia Park. Yeah. Yeah. A Bowling for Soup collaboration would be pretty cool. Oh my God, I would love that. I'm just like, Jared, call me up anytime. I'm here. Well, he's doing his country stuff at the moment, so that might be a nice sweet throwback mashup. I know, I saw that. I was like, as soon as I leave country music to make pop punk, I feel like everybody's leaving every other genre to make <laughs> to make country music. I was like, what is happening? It never used to be like this. That almost video, that got people like Butch Walker and Simple Plan commenting on it. That must have been a real buzz. It was really, really cool just to have, you know, those bands that I've admired for years and years and years have really like shed so much light on my career and the reasonings why I've even, you know, started making music in the first place, like acknowledging that I exist. It just, it means a lot, you know, it's, it's really, really cool. And it definitely like when people on the internet can't be, have a really hard time being nice, you know, to see bands like that being like, what you're doing is really cool. And and we appreciate it. It kept me going too. You know, it kept me wanting to keep putting out covers and wanting to me to keep pursuing this genre of music just because the bands, they're just so cool. Humble people, everybody that I've had the opportunity of meeting and stuff like that have just been amazing. I mean, the Simple Plan guys, some of the nicest people I think I've ever met in my life. I don't know if it's the Canadian thing about them, but they're just so cool, so nice. So yeah, it's it was really cool. Was that around the time then you realized there might be some real legs in embracing your pop punk influences? Because at the time, like you mentioned, you were forging a country music route in Nashville. But yeah. I don't think you were really feeling it was totally what you were about. You know, I'd always wanted to make the kind of music that I make now. I think I just genuinely didn't know how to go about doing it because I felt so pigeonholed into this I'm a country artist. Like this is the kind of music I have to make. I have no other choice. And the beauty about TikTok is that it just opens up so many. The algorithm is very scary sometimes because it can kind of open you up to anybody and everybody. But I was really fortunate in the sense of like it opened me to the fan base of people that I was hoping for. And so um, I think it really, honestly, like you said, it just it kind of made me realize like, hey, maybe this is like what I should have been doing all along. And it just validated that for me. And it made it a lot easier to make that transition because I had already had these fans of emo and pop punk that have kind of already understood, you know, like this is what she's doing. She's a fan of the music because I try to be very strategic in the songs that I would choose. I would choose like very well-known songs, but I'd also choose like deeper cut songs by like bands like The Story So Far and Sayosin and stuff like that to be like, hey, I'm a fan just like you guys. I know my shit. Love these songs. Yeah. And I just love these songs and I want to put my own spin on it, whether people thought I put my own spin on it or not. I had so much fun with it in the time. So it was one of those things where it just kind of helped push me into where I am now. And thankfully, people listen to my music at the same time and appreciate that too. I think it's really interesting with like, let's call them like music trends and just uh, the industry influences the directions we take. Sometimes you have to go on a journey like you did through country to realize it's where you started that what really makes you happy and embrace it. Yeah. And I think at that time, you know, when I started making country music, I was so young. I had no idea about the music industry at all. So I think it was very valuable for me to be able to kind of navigate my way through that and meet people and learn how the music industry works before finally deciding like, hey, I'm going to take this on my own and try to turn it into something now that I have the knowledge. And, you know, I had a little bit of a fan base and things like that. And like I said, very thankful that they're incredible and they stuck with me and like they did not have to do that at all. And I've seen so many bands, you know, try to make the transition and artists try to make the transition and it doesn't typically go like that. So it is just cool that these people have been just so diehard for me and understand they've understood the assignment (laughs) and they, uh, they've been just very supportive through it all. So that's been the best thing ever. The music industry has been, well, it's always been unpredictable as to what is going to break through. And your story is no different. I mean, long gone are the days of people in the UK heading to London or people in the States going to LA and creating a buzz or playing all over the country for someone to take notice. We mentioned your pop punk and emo covers gaining traction online, but if you want mine, would you share your story of your break into country with your Taylor Swift YouTube cover? Because that's a real one-off story as well, I think. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. That one was very, very funny. I just, I don't want to say drop out because that sounds, I withdrew from college. So I still have my credits. Anybody that's asking, I'm not technically a dropout. Kind of am. Never went back to college. Dropout sounds kind of cooler in rock and roll. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Probably will never go back. So maybe I am a dropout. I don't know. But I was making these YouTube videos. I just, you know, left college and wanted to find my own way through music somehow. And, you know, YouTube was such a big thing at the time. And seeing people get their start through that and seeing people do videos, I just prop my, I think it was like an iPhone 4 at the time, like the worst quality ever. Prop it up. I would sit in my mom's kitchen, prop it on the windowsill. So I had lighting. <laughs> And I would just play my guitar and play these songs. And I did a cover of All You Had to Do Is Stay when the 1989 album came out. And she had taken off all of the music from all of this. She like pulled like a Garth Brooks and took everything off of every streaming platform, YouTube, everything. So you could only buy the records. I mean, you got to go to a record store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you had to go to like Target or Walmart and like buy a CD or buy an actual record. And that was a real curveball to the younger fans. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're like, what? But to me, I was like, you know, that's actually really, really smart for her because that album, everybody wanted it. Everybody loved it. It's like still one of my favorite albums of hers, I think, that she's ever put out. And so um, I did a cover of that song. And in that time, she pulled everything off the internet and other YouTube creators and things like that. They would do like the lyric videos and stuff to these songs. You know, they, I don't want to say would steal the audio, but I guess they kind of would in a way, but they had nothing to take that audio from to make a lyric video. And so they took my audio, pitched it up, you know, a couple octaves. So it was like, it was pretty high. And then they put the 1989 cover on the front of it. So it looked like this is the real audio of All You Had to Do Is Stay by Taylor Swift. And so um, I, you know, back in the day, you had to do what you had to do. I was broke. I was burning CDs and I wanted to make a Taylor Swift CD for my sister for Christmas, unknowing that all of those songs had been taken off the internet. And I had given it to my sister, not knowing, you know, I'd just seen the covers and I was like, oh, that says official audio. Okay, I'm going to download that. Gave the CD to my sister. She's listening to it one day in her room, comes over and she was like, I think you need to hear this. <laughs> I went over in her room and she was like, I think this is your cover because you can hear how I'm playing the guitar and you could hear the cadence of my voice, but it was kind of hard to tell because it was like pitched up so high. And so I went directly to YouTube and I was like, what is this thing? Like, and looking at all the comments, they're like, this is Taylor Acorn's cover. This is Taylor Acorn. This is Taylor Acorn. And it got kind of crazy to the point where like the creator, people were like, you didn't give her any credit. And so the creator took off all the comments and like blocked me oh, from no. YouTube and all. this. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, I had a lot of people like coming to be like, you need to give this person credit. I didn't care because I was like, oh my gosh, people are coming from this audio to my cover. And at that time, you know, 100,000 views or whatever was like a big deal. Not so much anymore. It's like, you know, you get a million, then it's like, oh, you're doing great. But um, it was a big deal back then. So I thought that that was really, really cool. And from that, I had a guy reach out who was working as an intern in the music industry here in Nashville. And he was like, hey, I think you have a lot of potential. I had kind of been writing a few songs on my own. And so I just sent him whatever material I had from like a voice memo from my phone. And he was like, this is great. This will do. Flying you to Nashville. So we took all of those songs, sent them to a producer. He kind of built out the track and then I just sang on it. And then the rest is kind of history. I just fell in love with it. It's nuts. I mean, that's a story you could not. I mean, I was make up. I was so I was so broke. That's just so unpredictable. When I had it, I was like, damn. Yeah, I was I was so broke. I was working at Texas Roadhouse. I was absolutely miserable. I had no direction. I wanted to make music. But you know, when you're living like that, and you have no money, it kind of feels like you can't really just drop everything and move. I am a Virgo. We're a little bit pessimistic sometimes, I think. Me too. <laughs> Are you a Virgo also? Yeah. No way. When's your birthday? September 17th. Okay. Mine's the 21st. So we're kind of on that same, that <laughs> same like end of the September spectrum. Yeah. So, you know, it's like you want to be optimistic, but there's always like that. But what if, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a planner. I like plans. I like to know what's going on. Yeah. I like to oh, know totally. what people are thinking. I, I just like to know everything. So 
for me, it was like, I don't know if I can just go and just drop everything and go out. But I decided to take the chance. And I've been, you know, here in Nashville since 2017. After I had gotten those songs produced, I put out like a little EP called Put It In A Song, which were just all songs that I had written in my bedroom. It was crazy seeing them come to life because I had never even been a part of a production process, nothing. But it all just came very natural to me. And I always felt like there was a part of me that I think that I can really do this. But how do I get there? How do I start? How do you get your foot in the door? And once I did that, all of these little like pieces started coming into place and I got signed to a publishing company out here in Nashville. So I was writing with different country artists and things and putting out my music through that. I guess when you're in a city which is like built around music, things move at a much faster pace. Yeah. And I think it was interesting because at that time I was not living in Nashville. When I did get signed, I was going back and forth and I would stay for like a week stint of time or like two weeks and was like coming back and forth. Was it getting more exciting each time you was coming back? Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, put out that record, put in a song and I was getting emails from people that were like, we want to sign you to this publishing company. We want you as a writer. We want you as this. And I was kind of like a little bit of like the new shiny thing. I wasn't from Nashville. So people were like, what the heck is this? Like, where did this come from? I'm so out of left field. But coming here, writing for that publishing company, getting acquainted with different artists and this new life, I think was kind of overwhelming for me, honestly. Like I come from a very small town. I am not a city girl. I am kind of introverted. So going from being so comfortable and posting videos online where I have like this shield to now I don't have that anymore. It was kind of overwhelming. And I found that my anxiety and depression and things like that really started kicking in. And I decided ultimately after like a year, I didn't think that being at that publishing company and being in that world, doing that was really for me. And so my publishing company and I, we had left on very, very amicable terms and they let me keep all of my songs that I had written, which was really amazing of them. They're like We're going to hold on to these for 15 years, get back to us then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they might have some, I don't know, but all of the songs that I had released through them because they acted as like a label too. It was was really interesting because that's when like the publishing companies decided to step in and do the artist development thing like we're going to sign you as a writer but we're also going to push you as an artist but at that time you know after a little while some things within the company happened and the person that was running that side of the publishing company dissolved and got let go and so I was just writing and I wanted to play music I wanted to go out and perform I, I've always loved performing and so it just didn't feel I felt like I was missing something I think and um you know when I left, it was not easy because I had to, you know, go back to working a bunch of normal jobs. And I don't want to say normal jobs because there's nothing wrong with that. Had my fair share of waitressing and being a secretary and all of these things, but I'm very happy that I get to make music full time again. And this time on a, I think, an even better setting. Because you mentioned you're originally from a small town. Is it Wellsboro, Pennsylvania? Yes. Yep. What was your introduction to pop punk back then? Was it a radio thing, influence from friends? Well, so it's really interesting because because I say I'm from Wellsboro, but our story is very interesting because we've kind of moved around. So I'm originally, I was born in St. Paul, Minnesota. We lived there for a few years. My dad got a job out in Seattle. And so we had moved to a suburb of Seattle. And in Seattle, the rock scene is like huge. That's the thing. The grunge music, Pearl Jam, Dave Matthews bands, like all of that early 90s grunge, late 80s, that was such a big thing out there. And so when I would listen to the radio, I was hearing bands like Stained and Puddle of Mud and The Verve Pipe and oh my gosh, like Vertical Horizon, bands like that. And I fell in love with that like instantly. Gin Blossoms, like that's the kind of music that I, even as like a young kid, I was like, this is so different. It's so different. And it's like edgy. And I don't know if I was just sad all the time, sad as a kid, but I just gravitated towards that kind of music and like the way that it made me feel and so when I started growing up, I kind of started to dabble more. So I was actually into heavier music, I guess, dad rock or butt rock, whatever they would call it now. Bands like that, Three Days Grace and Breaking Benjamin and Atrey You and, you know, just stuff like that is what I listened to. And then I think the first band that I found was actually Mayday Parade. I was, again, being bad kid, burning CDs illegally. I think I had just like found a lesson in romantics and had downloaded the whole album. I was like 13, like 12, 13 years old. They were on my, on this burnt CD. And I was like, what is 
this that I stumbled upon. I was like so excited. Old school playlist right there. <laughs> yes. So it was like, it was like them. It was like every avenue. It was like the very first Can't Stop, Won't Stop, The Way We Talk, The Main, like all of those songs, those albums is what I found. I was like, this just hits different in a way that I've never felt before. And once I found that and I started listening to it, I just became obsessed. And Paramore became a big thing. And I was so inspired by Haley and the way that she performs and the energy. And of course, Evanescence was a big thing too. You know, that was kind of when I was diving more so into the butt rock stuff, but I just gravitated more so towards that kind of music than anything else. And so it was kind of like a gradual, like, but being in such a small town, like from what I can recall, I don't think that very many people in my school listened to pop punk. It was me and like one other girl. I remember having a conversation about A Day to Remember because she was wearing a shirt. You could spot her from a mile away. Yeah. She's like me. She's one of us. And I was like, wait a (laughs) second. And her and I were actually, we were really good friends for a while. And then obviously, you know, you grow up and you find your own groups and things like that. But yeah, like I felt like I was kind of an outcast, but I would share a lot of my music with my best friend and stuff. I remember sending her A Day to Remember and her being like, I really like this, but the screaming is kind of scary. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, it was like things like that found Hey Monday and it was just fun, you know, to be able to kind of dive into that. And I felt like it was my own little thing that I had myself, no one else. So I would opt to making like our soccer playlists and like basketball playlists. And I'd always those songs in there. I was like, everybody needs to hear this. What can I get away with? Yeah. A lot of songs they'd be like, yeah, can you like take that off of there? It's a little too, it's, a little, oh, no. it's a too much. So was your town big enough for a hot topic? Uh, no, we did not have a hot topic. No, we had a lot of, I would say like, We we had nothing. We had no stores. Okay. We were like an hour away from, I guess, the bigger city in New York state. And then an hour from a bigger city in Pennsylvania called Williamsport. And that's where they have the Little League World Series here. I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. I know that there's probably some British teams and stuff that come and they'll play these kids that are phenomenal at baseball. But there was a hot topic. But even back then it was like, ooh, kind of taboo to go in there. Like, we would sneak in. I always kind of felt like this is my place, but I always looked like I didn't belong, if that makes sense. You're not fully committed yet. <laughs> yes. I was very much in my soul. I was, this is everything that I love. But my mom was like, you need to wear color and you need to like go to church. I think there was just a darkness in me that would gravitate towards that. And I was like, I just want to be there. Those are my people. Once you made this transition into this new chapter of your career, how was it for you performing in like this rock and punk environment for the first time? Was this whole big release and brand new feeling? Ah. I felt like I had been a bird that was caged for years, okay? Because, you know, I always wanted to perform like that. And I definitely did have, even when I was in country music, we would cover a lot of the pop punk songs and things like that. But it's very interesting because at that time, I have a very high energy performance. And even when I was in country, it was still very high energy, but it was like dialed down a little bit. I don't headbang as much as I do now and things like that. or like jump around as much as I do now, but definitely was like, a higher energy. And so I think a lot of people really weren't sure how to take it. And I'm definitely one of those people where I thrive off of the energy of the crowd. If the crowd feels a little awkward, then I'm like, ooh, ah, am I doing too much? And I think about it a little too much. So being able to perform for a very like energetic crowd that's there to enjoy the music, you know, scream the songs and crowd surf. And I remember when we were opening for Real Friends and we got our first crowd surfers, I felt like this hallelujah moment. I was like, this is what I've been needing for so long. And it's been really cool because I've been able to really like experiment with my performance. And it's awesome too, because my guitarist Ricky is so, his energy is so crazy. So like to feed off of him as well has been really fun, like to have our our little little like things that we do and guess it would be our little like rehearsed moments and stuff like that. It's been really fun. And also just to see like how excited people are and how they say that they like the energy because I feel like I'm such an energetic person just in general. So to be able to go on stage and run around and jump and I can't do backflips, but if I could, I would probably do that. (laughs) You're touring and playing so much. I guess it feels like you're constantly learning and evolving the more shows you Mm -hmm. do. Do you think you're like developing a character, a Taylor Acorn character at all? Yeah, 
definitely. I definitely have a separation between the person that I am on stage and the person that I am off. Off stage, I'm very relaxed and kind of quiet and chill. And when I'm on stage, I feel like it's all of that angst and energy is like... Unlocked. Here we go. It's kind of weird. It's kind of like I turn into this different human. And it's not that it's not genuine. It's just all of that person that's been sitting in my body wanting to come out comes out when I'm on stage. And it's really weird. I'll get off stage a lot of the times and I'm kind of like, what did I even say? You just go on stage and you turn and it's it's like autopilot. Yeah. There was actually an interview from Ryan Reynolds, of all people. It was very, very weird. I could not relate more because obviously he's like very funny and like a really well-known actor and everybody sees him as like this super funny like entity. He was explaining it. He was like, honestly, I'm not really like that in real life. But as soon as I'm on a stage or I'm behind a camera, that person just comes out. I don't know how it happens and I kind of black out and it just is a natural thing that just occurs as soon as I'm out in front of people. But as soon as I'm, I step away, it's, oh, well, I'm just a normal person. It's like a dual personality in a way. Yeah, it kind of is. And that's a little scary if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a big US tour coming up too with Dashboard Confessional and Boys Like Girls later in this year. Yeah. What would teenage Taylor Acorn say if she knew all this would be happening? I think that she would be in cardiac arrest. So I don't think (laughs) that she would have anything to say because they'd be wheeling her off on a stretcher. She'd literally be in a coma. But it's crazy because I was actually talking to somebody about this the other day. I can put myself in the time and the place the first time I ever heard Dashboard. And it was actually when Stolen, I would probably was like 11, 12 years old. That song came out a long time ago. I have like the music video in my head. I'm a big visual person. Seeing that music video and seeing that song and... I fell in love with it. Just loved it so much. And the vibe just felt so good. And I became such a huge fan of Dashboard from then on. And so it is very weird and feels very full circle. Also, too, because, you know, I had done covers of both of those band songs, you know, a few years ago, too. I don't know. It's just to think of where I was when I first heard these bands to now that they trust me enough to like open up their show for them. It's a very weird feeling. I think young me would be like, whoa, this is crazy. But I also think if she would have known that all of this would happen, I think she would have been a little bit more excited about life. That sounds like very sad, but like, I think she would have been like very proud of who she would become eventually, even if, you know, there are like, all these different paths and twists and turns that had happened along the way. I think she would be really like proud. I love that. Yeah. What a great answer. No, I thank you. Yeah. (laughs) It's crazy. I hope I do a good job. That's like been the one thing where I'm very nervous to especially go before boys like girls because Martin has such an amazing voice. Is there any pressure though? I mean, I can get in that headspace if I was in a similar situation. I don't know if there's pressure. It's just exciting. You've got no pressure on you. You're the new act with these two almost legacy acts in that genre. You just got to go out and have a good time. But it's like you always want to leave a good impression and do a good job. I am, it's the Virgo energy in me, I swear, but I'm a perfectionist at heart. So I want to make sure I go out there and get the crowd as warmed up and as excited for these bands as I possibly can. And so I think that's the pressure that I'm feeling. But also too, I think over the years, you know, we've had a few years now of touring and played a lot of shows and I'm so confident in my band and I'm so confident in my crew. And We've had just such a wonderful experience growing and learning. And I believe that we're going to have so much fun. And I I really do believe that we'll be able to put on a good show. So I'm trying not to think about the pressure aspect of it as much and just go out there. Like you said, there really isn't if you think about it. We're just going out, having fun, making sure the crowd is warmed up. They can listen to us if they want to. And if they enjoy it, that's amazing. They want to like hang around with us for the future. I would love that. But they're there to see those bands at the end of the day. And we just want to make sure that they're as happy as they can be going into it and excited for the shows to come. So yeah, I think that's like the biggest thing is just telling myself that you're good. You've done this. You're not new to this. This is something that you love. And now you get to do it on a stage that you can actually run around on. And I think that's like the most exciting thing for me is that I'm pretty tall and I like to just run. And so I'm like, I don't feel confined. You're not going to have the bass drum right behind you. Yeah, I'm not going to back up and trip over Connor's drums anymore. You know, it's just dream venues too. And it's always nice to go back to playing a 30 minute set too. I won't lie. (laughs) Yeah, you can keep that energy like super high. You can keep it high and then you're done and then you can enjoy the other bands. And there is like, you're right, there's no pressure. And I think it's going to be really awesome. 
you know, we've worked our way up now to the point where I feel like, okay, we deserve to play these venues now too, because we've done our work and we're, we're growing every time we're growing and it's getting bigger and it's getting, you know, more exciting. And not to say that it wasn't exciting before because it always is, but now it's like I get to play in front of a few thousand people rather than, you know, a small club. Last question. I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh gosh. I want you to time travel well before your time oh God. to a Friday night in the late 80s or early 90s. Uh-huh. You head into the video store. What movie soundtrack do you have on the Walkman and what three tapes are you going to rent for the weekend? Oh my God. I probably have The Breakfast Club. Soundtrack or film or both? Both. And I actually watched that movie on the plane on the way to Australia. And I was like, I'm just like such a sucker for old movies. I love that movie. How does it hold up for you? I think it's still relatable. Still great. Yeah, the themes are still there. Love it. I think it really depicts the different demographic of high schoolers today and the things that we go through. And so I, I really, really like that. And that ending scene is so iconic. What were some of the like the big movies you went to the cinema to see? I mean, oh gosh, we saw so many. It's been a long time now. <laughs> did you have a local movie theater? We did. We did. When I was in high school, we had a very, very small movie theater. All of my friends worked there, so they would sneak us in for free. There was like four theaters, so it was like very small. Like it was not big at all. The soundtracks. Oh my gosh. You know what? American Pie all of those like late 90s, like early 2000s movies, they all have incredible soundtracks. When I listen back to them, I'm like, what happened to the OG pop punk songs being what carries the soundtrack? Well, that shows how the industry's changed because going back to, I'm like a rock fan. I used to love horror films. So I'd buy all the horror soundtracks and that got me into all the rock bands. Oh yeah. Like Scream and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You used to have such great soundtracks. Like who's this band? And yeah. Bands you'd never heard of. It was great. What movies had a big influence on you? Movies. I mean, The Breakfast Club, I loved. I love, oh God, we watched so many movies over the years so i'm like what would be a good pizza night a good pizza night for me i mean 10 things i hate about you okay great movie also great soundtrack there you go I love that soundtrack so you got breakfast club going you can have 10 things i hate about you on the way back we've got et that's a good one too you want to see a grown man cry a 50 year old man cry put et on oh my god <laughs> i won't lie it used to scare me really bad when i was a kid but i've grown to really love it over the years like it's very sweet it's a very sweet movie but yeah, I think that was like early, the late 90s, early 2000s, like 10 Things I Hate About You, like that kind of genre of movie I'm a sucker for even still to this day. I'll watch them all if I have nothing else to do. And all of their soundtracks are so, so good. They'll have Matchbox 20 playing, you know, it's like that kind of vibe. Superb. Taylor, thank you for chatting with me. Of course. Thank you for having me. I hope you have a blast in the UK at both Slam Dunk and you're doing a headline show in London. I wish you all the best and hopefully maybe a full tour later down the line, hopefully. Yes. Crossing our fingers, hoping for it. It's been a long time coming, but I have a feeling it's going to happen hopefully soon. Get Jarrett Reddick on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Bring me to the UK. Bring me with you. I'll fit in your suitcase. I'll make it work. <laughs> awesome. It's been so nice to talk to you, Rob. Thank you. Massive thanks to Taylor Acorn for all the great stories right here on the Straight to Video podcast. Hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you're heading to Slam Dunk Festival this weekend, please make sure to head on over to our stage and check out The Rock Show. Tell her we sent you. For all other dates, check out TaylorAcorn.com and the new single and video High Horse are out now. So that's all for this week's podcast, but I'll be back, as always, for a brand new episode next Friday. So until then, make sure to always be kind. Please rewind and unwind, and I'll speak to you all real soon. <laughs>